So, thanks a lot for having me here. It's such a great pleasure to see so many people I've known for many years and also new faces in person again. So that's a wonderful experience. And so um, actually I can be relatively short with the first parts of the talk because so many things have already been said and I will rather try to spend my time as we are limited on those things that are sort of like really new. So I think we all have seen that face diagram I think now often enough and the question is how do we uh, model that? And this is again a question that has come up um, many times already in this conference. We have very complicated um, substances and then we have to come down to models that are simpler and simpler and one of them for example, this, hang on where is this, ah, okay. Uh, we have to go with well, three band, Philip talked a bit about this, but most of the talks have been about the single band Harvard model, which of course I do not have to explain here again. And the question that is a bit in the room is, is this model too simple? Um, we have heard a lot about, well, the antiferromagnetism, lots about the pseudogap behavior. This talk will be focusing at, about, at t equals zero, the presence of stripes and mainly the presence of power law D-wave superconducting correlations or uh, superconducting order. And the question will be, do we have to complexify the Hubbard model, to, um, which means here in this particular context, uh, uh, con text that we have to introduce or do not have to introduce uh, next nearest neighbor hopping T prime. And I think this is of course of interest for the people from the ultra code atom uh, background because irrespective of the issues um, with temperature, putting in the T prime is also not an, an also a non-trivial uh, challenge um, we have. So for us from condensed matter physics it's yet another parameter which we play around with or which nature dictates. Uh, for these experiments it's a little bit different. So this slide I can jump across. We have heard about the problem of how magnetic order um, sort of like fights against the motion of the holes and that stripes or pairing are a simple way of reducing this competition. We have seen this I think many times so I will jump that slide as well. And then of course I think this is a slide that we also have seen in variations. There have been of course an enormous amount of studies and other people have shown even more papers. I just want to point out that some of these ideas like stripes or um, uniform D-way superconductor, they now go back several decades and we are still discuss discussing this stuff in here today because of all um, that. And so um, I think uh, this was an idea which originated a couple of years ago that we simply have to go back to the drawing board um, because there have been of course lots of numerical studies um, about the Hubbard model and each of these uh, methods has its own shortcomings and we come to this idea of the handshake which Antoine has been talking about um, a lot which is that in the past you you thought that your method had the better results because you did it um, and um, so <laughs> we should really move to the point where uh, we should only believe results where the methods really mutually support each other and this idea really took off with this paper where I was not involved in but I think it's the basis of this entire work I will be showing in the talk, um, where various groups, the MRG, DMET, Auxiliary Field Quantum Monte Carlo, and IPEPS, I mean you have heard and seen uh, Philip uh, yesterday, came together to see basically where can these results be made to agree. Still you don't have to p believe each individual method, but if very different methods with that very different shortcomings give the same result with an error bars, then this is really strong. And of course, um, whenever you show such results, you will have people who will tell you, well, I told you so, say 30 years ago. But the difference is that what was sort of like lots of conjectures, um, which were more or less well based in their, those days, you can now basically say, well, it is so because we can really show it without any doubt. So this told you so will not get you out. Uh, although, of course, for people doing numerics, I say this for the entire community, this is, of course, sometimes a little bit of a thankless task if you show something properly. And, of course, there have always been some approximations that yielded that, perhaps by chance, perhaps because they were really smart. No one knows. But anyways, the, the results from the, this paper have also been discussed by several people like Antoine and Philippe. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, that what you find is 
um, I will focus on this picture here, that all these methods agree that the ground state at what was it, u equals 8, um, uh, typical filling, I think this was 1 8th, um, what they show is degenerate stri uh, stripes um, where the energies of the various wavelengths of the stripes were almost degenerate. So this is really very small differences which you are looking at indeed, but there was also agreement that the pure D wave was quite a bit higher in energy. Um, so um, so the, the focus in that work at t prime equals zero had been quite a bit on the stripe order. So the question is, um, what about D wave pairing order? Do superconducting correlations exist? And there's also, of course, lots of work which say yes and no. Um, and of course, you would also like to understand, is there competition between these phenomena or are they rather in cooperation? And here, a, set, a sort of a subset of the people uh, came together. And this subset was, on the one hand, the DMRG people, um, where Steve, um, me, and Claudia Subic was a PhD student in my group. Chia Min was postdoc with Steve and with me. Uh, and on the other side, um, there's Shive um, with all the people doing this auxiliary field. Uh, quantum Monte Carlo and the results of that paper and I think some people here in the audience probably have heard uh, um, presentation presentations about that already but so I'll keep that relatively um, short is but it's the spirit also for the work which we have now done at T prime non equal to zero which of course will be my main focus. So let me go a little bit into what we did because in some sense this will continue with some modifications when it comes to the um, T prime. So here, I mean, I want to be sort of like honest and show the shortcomings of both the methods that meet each other, that you see that they are really different in nature. And here, this slide is very similar to what Philippe already showed yesterday, is you can use DMRG in two dimensions if you map the problem to a one-dimensional snake. And then, uh, of course, you have the entanglement, the area law entanglement across any cut. So this cut is simple. We have many um, DMRG lines going through this. This can be easily modeled. If you introduce periodic boundary conditions, well, it gives you some extra cost because this guy will now talk to this guy, but this is manageable. The real problem, as was already uh, mentioned yesterday, is a cut through the system, which you do like this. All the entanglement has, be to, has to be modeled by this one bond here. Um, and, so, and, and as was already explained yesterday, in some sense, this means that the DMRG bond dimension or MPS bond dimension, which you have to use at that point, basically grows exponentially with the system um, size. And this is a real uh, problem. IPEPS, for example, avoids that, as you have heard, but has other issues. Um, so what the consequence for DMRG has been historically that people look at cylinders, so relatively long systems, because one dimension is not a problem, and the other one is relatively short. You use periodic boundary conditions or any other boundary conditions, but just not open ones, to minimize the effects of the um, finite size. So we look at cylinders, and they are small. In a way, you could say DMRG in two dimensions is like ED. When you do it properly, the results are really highly reliable, but you hit, hit an exponential wall with system size. It's basically the same story. Now, auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo here, I'm of course not talking about uh, my, my, my own uh, exp area of expertise is basically you do a projection in time or imaginary time of some initial wave function, which hopefully has an overlap um, with the ground state. Then you can evol um, evaluate observables um, like this. If you want to do that using Slater determinants because it's very efficient, you have to get away from the quartic term of the interaction. And that is done by doing a hubbard Spratonovich and the hubbard Spratonovich in this particular case leads to a setup where you then basically have to sum analytically or sample um, stochastically over an auxiliary field which here can take two values plus or minus one. The, the, the details don't matter here, but what you can see already in this picture is this is a typical result is you get really large errors in the energy when you do the projection towards um, beta goes to infinity, and this is the good old sign problem. And what these guys do uh, to get out of it 
is that um, this is a very schematic picture. Imagine this is your initial state, which goes randomly through space as you sample your auxiliary um, field. And as long as its sign with the exact ground state stays, say, positive, it's just fine. The problem is if the sign, if it hits zero, then you can show mathematically that there must be exactly symmetric paths um, which give a plus sign and a minus sign, mathematically they cancel exactly fine, but of course this exact analytical cancellation is not captured by the sampling. Once again, the typical sign problem. So what do these guys do is they only want to keep the paths that are on the positive side, those that are perf totally on the negative side, this is symmetric, there's no problem about that, um, and to find um, this condition, which is an exact one to get rid of the sign problem, what they do is they replace the exact wave function, which of course we do not know, otherwise no need to do all that, by an approximate nodal structure by a trial um, wave function. Uh, so, and that then helps to improve results a lot, but of course you depend on the quality of this trial wave function, how close it is to the actual uh, ground state wave function you would like to have. So um, there have been algorithmic um, developments. I have to be brief about them. In DMRG, the typical thing is you have these sort of like two sides at the center of your problem, which you sweep forth and back. And what you can also do is you can sweep a single side. Um, this is much faster than this usual sweeping. The problem is it's numerically unstable. Um, um, however, we were able to overcome that problem already quite some time ago, so we get this stably converging. And the other thing is the usual truncation error which DMRG people need for the extrapolations doesn't work anymore. You have to introduce an error monitoring by variance, which is often way too complicated to calculate, in particular like tough problems like here. And there we came up with a proxy that allows extremely reliable extrapolations to the thermodynamic um, uh, sorry, to the exact limit, not the thermodynamic one. Okay, the, the, the Monte Carlo people came up with bet better trial wave functions and also s all sorts of other uh, technical improvements. Now the strategy of the whole thing is that we take the quasi-exact DMRG results on cylinders up to width six to basically nail down the precision of the AFQMC as good as we can. And then we take the AFQMC, which does not have these size restrictions, to take the results to the thermodynamic limit. And the, the results for, so what we measure here is basi basically typically three quantities. Um, we apply a pairing field globally and then we observe the pairing response, whether this also survives if, if we take the pairing field towards zero, or we apply a pairing field at the edge of the system, see how the um, superconducting order parameter decays into the system, or we calculate, which is the hardest, the pair-pair correlations, how they um, uh, decay. And so what we found in the past for the um, T prime equals zero um, case was that, to cut a long story short, is uh, we didn't see any evidence of uh, the superconductivity. Let me focus, because this shows you the difficulty of the calculations, um, on this DMRG calculation here. Okay, um, the correlations are harder than order parameters, so this is about the hardest we can calculate. But just look at these numbers. This was a calculation which exploited the SU2 invariance, which not many DMRG codes can do. And we had to go up to 22,000 states to basically come from here to here. And this still has to extrapolate it, be extrapolated very carefully to the sort of extrapolated exact results. And in standard DMRG lingo, these 22,000 states would correspond to about 70,000, uh, which means this is really about the limit of what you can <coughs> expect to achieve. Um, I mean, most DMRG codes basically manage to go up to 10,000 or so, and, and even the 70,000 only gets you that far and you have to extrapolate very carefully. So um, cylinders of width eight for the Hubbard model, I think are completely unfeasible with DMRG for the foreseeable future. It would need um, some really smart idea for spin systems. It, it, the situation is much better. 
Anyways, so what we then did is we compared this to AFQMC. The comparisons worked extremely well. I won't go into the details, but go to the sort of like result uh, which then finally emerged. We, we extrapolated all the system sizes, um, all the results numerically to exact, and then we extrapolated in the system size, and what we found in these old results was that basically um, uh, the, in the thermodynamic limit, no pairing order survives consistently with all the different calculations we did. So this was now a very brief um, um, look at the T prime equals zero summary. Uh, the, period, the stripes we, were, we found were period eight, um, but that's again in consistent with what had already been found in this earlier papers. Um, we, of course, it should be said that for weak U, there is superconductivity. I mean, uh, but n not in the, um, um, in that case, it would be very weak, but it's not in the range of the coup rates. We didn't find anything there. So now I was really fast. I have to catch up <coughs> my breath a little bit and move now to what I think is more interesting here um, today and slow down now, um, which is what happens if you switch on um, T prime. The value of T prime we, we took is, well, there's various values you can believe in, but we ultimately settled on minus 0.2. Many other people use um, the same value. And now the question is what happens to superconductivity here? Um, the paper we are going to write is at the moment we are in the writing progress. You will see that from, from the figures that they are not yet um, polished. This is on the one hand uh, DMRG by Chia Min, uh, uh, Steve and myself, and how Ming Pu and Shi Wei uh, have been doing the AF um, QMC um, simulations um, here. So, um, um, so what has been done? Yeah, I can be fast again. This is the wonderful work that Philippe presented to us yesterday, where he says, okay, he gets the, uh, with four stripes um, in the competition, he sees D-wave pairing, in his case, at a doping around 0.14 onwards, and his and period four stripes are set already, for U equals 10 and doping one eighth. I hope I present that correctly. And uh, what, what Philippe did is the sort of like the kind of bias which IPEPS has that he has to define a unit cell which is infinitely repeated. He turned into the advantage that he simply compared the results from different unit cells. But of course, we would like to know what would come out if Philippe could do, do even larger unit cells to, to, um, um, to uh, confirm his results. But this is, I think, the best I have seen. And so there was other work, uh, which was also briefly mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, where DMRG observed um, a power law decay of uh, D-wave correlations on with four cylinders. This was the science paper from 2019. And here, unfortunately, it turns out that although I think these results are numerically perfectly correct, they are not probably relevant to the problem at hand because of some quirk of the cylinder. Um, this is actually something that had already been pointed many years ago by Steve White and Dux Calapino, but somehow been forgotten a little bit. And so basically we revived the memory because it's unlike animal farm, four legs good, two legs bad. That's not uh, true here. Because if you look at a cylinder with four legs, that's this object here. You can put D-wave plaquettes on it like this, so like on the surface of the cylinder. And this is, of course, what is the 2D um, way of thinking about it, because you can make the cylinder larger and larger and still put these D-wave plaquettes on the outside of the cylinder in this way. So that's the kind of D-wave superconductivity we would like to see. On the other hand, in the very special case of four, uh, four legs, you can also put plaquettes here like slicing a salami. And that is, of course, a purely one-dimensional problem. And you can continue that as long as you like. But it has no extrapolation towards two uh, dimensions. So there are two competing types of D-wave pairing correlations feasible on a, a width four um, a system. And the question is, of course, which one was observed? Only one of them is relevant for us. 
So, and what it turns out is to go through this story here in these upper two curves, we, we observed the pairing correlation between this um, uh, bond here and sort of like the blue ones and the red ones. And that's the ones which you would have to observe for this salami slicing. And they would have to have opposite sign um, if you are looking actually at this salami D wave. And that's unfortunately exactly the case. If you give a minus to one of them, they are really on top of each other. So this is power law, but this is the sort of like these slices here. If you, if you look at the correlations which you require for the kind of D wave that sits on the surface of the cylinder, the 2D one, uh, that goes down exponentially, unfortunately. So this power law decay is essentially a one-dimensional um, effect. So now let's turn uh, to the new results. And as a teaser, um, what we did is we looked at u equals 8, t prime minus two, uh, 0 0.20. Then we did this usual thing that by switching the sign of the t prime, we went from hole doping to electron doping. Um, and then uh, what we also had to do, which came as a surprise to us and which has complicated our work drastically, the enormous importance of boundary conditions. So what we did is we looked at a wide range of boundary conditions, not just PBC or APBBC, but we really went through the phases and, and averaged and did this mutual be benchmarking as before. It's the same spirit. And we then mainly looked at the pairing order parameter, the response to a pairing field, and then extrapolated that first to the thermodynamic limit and then to the limit of a zero a pairing field. And that produced this result here as a function of doping for u equals 8. We find that as the order parameter, which is strongest between, say, 1 eighth and 1 fifth, not totally unexpected. Um, and here, there's also weaker superconductivity on the electron dope side. And so, of course, you don't have to believe that. So let me spend a few minutes on showing you a small selection of, of plots, um, how we went about that. So um, first of all, um, look, let's look at the benchmarking. Here, uh, we look at the whole density of this system that happens to be an electron doped one, but it's all very typical. And what you can see here is first of them, look at these four curves. Um, the agreement between DMRG and AFQMC, we also did such stuff on with six cylinders, just to make sure, um, is really extremely good. Um, what you see here very nicely is, for example, you see two stripes, um, and here you see the, uh, the phase shift by pi, <coughs> Uh, which happens on the stripe, you can produce all that um, sort of stuff. But what you also see, the change of the boundary conditions completely changed the result. Yeah? In these small systems, the results become extremely dependent on the boundary conditions you use. So this can only be a kind of a small subset. I mean, there's, there's one curve, this is actually about the worst curve we have. Um, this is now on a six, with six cylinder, which for DMRG is the end of the uh, story. It's also, again, it depends on the boundary conditions. Now it's the other way around, stripes now for the periodic ones, antiferromagnetism for the antiperiodic boundary conditions. Here you see agreement, extremely good. This is something we do not fully understand why there is this shift in the spin. Um, but still, I mean, all the wiggles um, are the same. And this is actually the worst, yeah? I mean, I did not try to show the best figure, but this is the one which I had on the laptop because <coughs> it gave us most uh, headache um, of all the comparisons. So, in, in, so this is why right here, it's really mostly an excellent agreement between the two methods. And actually, when we started out doing that two years ago, it was not like this. We learned a lot about both methods, which I think is yet another argument for this handshaking thing. And I would not be above saying that the one or other bug might have been detected over these two years just by making these checks extremely carefully. But what we observed is, as you can see here, we really have to average very carefully over 
twisted boundary conditions. The systems are small enough that this matters. For the T prime equals zero case, it did not matter, or not to any extent that was really beyond what you would typically expect, that of course numbers will change a little bit. But we think the most likely explanation is that the T prime destroys the nesting. We looked at the low-lying excited states with both methods to the extent that we can do that. And what you find is there's a huge bunch of low-lying states which change their, how should I say, they change their relative arrangement uh, when you play with the boundary conditions. This is why one has to be careful about that. And that basically explains also a little bit what you see on this slide here. This is um, for doping one fifth, whole doped T prime minus 0.2. And what you see here is, let's take the red curve and the black one the response of the pair ordering, pairing order parameter to a, an external pairing field, um, DMRG and QMC are in very nice agreement, but what you see is are these weird error bars. Now, whoever has done DMRG knows that when it works, the error bars are essentially non-existent. It either works or it fails. So where do these error bars come from? And the QMC people have essentially the same problem because this comes from averaging over the boundary conditions. Um, and this is sort of like what, what you then also see for this small cylinder, you don't see anything. It extrapolates nicely down to zero. Um, then you increase the system sizes. And then um, again with these error bars that come from the uh, boundary conditions, they get smaller. But then if you take the results and uh, extrapolate that first to the thermodynamic limit, and then you extrapolate that in the pairing field, um, we then get the finite response, uh, which we then uh, claim indicates that there is the uh, superconductivity there. So, Sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And the limit, of course, in the, the double limit taken in the right order. Otherwise, of course, anything yeah, would come up. Like no, no, no. The six leg cylinder is useless. I shouldn't say that as a DMRG person. Um, well, the six leg, I think this is now the Monte Carlo result, but ours would not be different. You still go down there. No, you really have to be able to do what admittedly, it's hard to admit, but what the quantum Monte Carlo people can do after they have actually um, uh, sort of like benchmark their method on the DMRG results, they can do that. Actually, one thing which I would like to say, I forgot to mention it, one thing which I have not shown because it's too good to be true. I mean, we are looking here at simple things like local order and stuff like this. But we also calculated with both methods independently natural orbitals. I mean, this is not a many body wave function, but it's still a relatively complicated single body wave function. And the overlap between the natural orbitals of these very two different, very different two methods was 97, 98%. That's a degree of control which uh, I would not yet want to put on a slide because you feel it sounds to be good to be true. Perhaps yeah. just for the sake of yeah. presentation, uh, this may be confusing to mm -hmm. some people in Berlin. So projected the FQMC is not an exact technique. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah but not everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, this is why the benchmarking is absolutely. Yeah. That's why I spent so many, uh, several slides on that, that we sort of like really know. And they had, of course, wonderful improvement, like that given the results they have, they can now improve their trial wave function, which they need to find these nodes in the Monte Carlo calculations. So in a way, it's a little bit self-improving now. I mean, uh, Shive and his guys have invented lots of things to make these uh, comparisons better. And this is actually, and we in DMRG, we also understood a few things which we hadn't understood before and how to do them properly. So we really helped each other to push these things um, to the extreme. But if you want to know the Monte Carlo details and improvements, please ask Shive. That is sort of like not my, 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 my merit. Yeah, and for DMRG, for example, um, we, we did many of the ca calculations with two independent codes, uh, not just to check for bugs, but Steve does this two side sweeping with its advantages and disadvantages, and our code does this one side sweeping with its 
problems and advantages. Our code can do non-abelian, his does abelian calculations, and we really want to see that they give the same results. Because the, the, the con convergence of DMRG in 2D, you have to know what you are doing. Um, you can get stuck, I mean, even if the code is perfectly uh, correct. So let me, let, so in a way, this is a main finding. Ah. I think this is one of the first attempts which are now underway to define a unified color scheme for the various system <laughs> sizes. Uh, and uh, uh, this, these are the pictures of two weeks ago. They, they are constantly shifting. I mean, not the numbers, but the colors are constantly shifting and I decided to stay with what I have. Um, uh, we will probably involve Chris Hohmann, you know whom I'm talking about. This is our local artist in residence who normally does the pictures for the experimentalists because um, we are sitting after two years on such a pile of results and now the question is um, because we spent basically 80% of the time on this benchmarking to really be sure what we are talking about then producing the actual results was then relatively fast and so and now we are a little bit confused uh, um, to what to show in which color and in which way to really convince people how, how controlled this is. Yeah, next slide, next slide. So um, the last one or two slides um, is, um, this is interesting in the sense that this is hold hope. Uh, what we find in AFQMC is six holes per stripe. Um, this is a width six. Um, and uh, pap actually, and this doubles a bit what I also have um, here. I should have sh shown only that slide. Uh, sorry about that. With four, we find the half filled striped uh, with um, uh, just like Philippe. Yeah. And um, in what, why did I say with eight? This is with six. Okay. This is sorry. Three. Ten. Yeah. I'm, I, I mistyped. Yeah. This is. Uh, okay. Well, okay, if, if, if you tell me it looks like eight, then I say it's eight because I typed it here. I might just be confused at the very moment. Um, but what, what our problem is, is of course, that uh, this is not in agreement. Um, uh, we still have to see this is one of the things where we do not know. We will perhaps present the results as we find them and not commit to a statement what the width of the stripes actually is. Um, there I cannot so more, but this is kind of the kind of the loose ends of the simulations. We have the stripes very clearly, but between simulations they jump a little bit. And in in the t uh, prime equals zero case, no one would be surprised because they are so close in energy. Well, and then you have boundary conditions and all these effects. Who would care? But as Philip showed in his simulations, it seems that the competition between the various stripes is actually going away, and that would not be consistent with what we see here. It should be less dependent on what we find. So here, please accept that here we have a question mark of what we should say, and um, uh, we are working on that. So let me jump for uh, the electron doped results, because uh, I don't know that much about it. There I can just say we find that the D-wave coexists with AFM, no face slips, but how reliable all that is, we still have to see. So that I want to say, show only very briefly, and rather jump uh, to the conclusion, which I will not read off, um, but rather take uh, questions. Thank you very much. I think you just said that pairing is weaker on the electron rope than the whole yeah. rope. And that seems to be opposite to what I think maybe Antoine said. Uh, uh, somebody no. had presented yesterday, yesterday. No. That I thought yesterday. Uh, <coughs> no, I think uh, I didn't say anything about that. Um, but I think Philippe made a statement for us. He got duty for the super. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. But, but I mean, that's not. Yeah. But that's not in contradiction. If I go back to this preliminary slide, oh, please don't hold me to that one. 
there is sort of like, this is if you really show the amplitudes, you see this is not stripy. I mean, it's, it's just kind of sort of like somehow the D wave is pretty uniform. I mean, I think we agree there. I think the question of uh, Subia was rather uh, related to the, uh, the, the size of the order parameter. And there the statement we have is very clearly, it's much weaker, well, much weaker, half 50% perhaps. Um, on the electron doped side, and I think I heard the same statement yesterday, but I thought it was like. Uh, I didn't know if you did not say anything about yeah. the magnitude. Yeah. Uh, so which I, I, I thought that. someone said yesterday something about electrons doped <laughs> side being weaker, but perhaps I wanted to hear that. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you just said, yeah. you, you see pairing positive heat, right? Which is electron doped. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so do we. Yeah. But he doesn't see both negative heat, right? At 1A. Okay. At 1A. Actually, he also doesn't see it at 1A. He uh, sees see it okay. at 1A. Uh, yeah. 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 Maybe you were confused by... I think there, there we agree. I mean, I'm only worried about the disagreement that Philippe and I have basically on the wavelength of the of the stripe, we are of course not using exactly the same parameters um, that might already explain the difference, uh, we will have to see. So at least the direction is the right one, so that's yeah, the yeah. easier Yeah, forward. absolutely, yeah. You had a slide with, with, with the superconducting order parameter as a function of electron hole doping. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there any signs of Competition with stripe order to be seen here, or in, mm. or with T prime not equal to zero, or they just don't talk to one another. Um, in the in the in, in the T prime equals zero case, we um, we checked that. I mean, we checked that, and there they were in comp They could coexist to some extent. They well, they did not. When I say to some extent, I mean there was no D wave order. That was the entire point of the paper. But you could see that when you looked at the, if you apply an external pairing field, there is of course a finite response, and that response went down when the stripes became, how should I say, stronger. In that sense, it was a competition. Um, here. Um, here at the moment, I would not yet want to commit to the data without looking at them more carefully. I mean, they coexist, whether it's a competition in the sense that they want to kill each other off or whatever that I would not want to commit, but they coexist very clearly. I mean, we have seen that here in... Um, Are the stripes getting weaker with uh, non-zero T prime? Um, we did not extrapolate, we, did, we do not have unfortunately results where we take the T prime continuously from zero to the minus 0.2 value. But just compare zero and 0.2. So we, we are all fixing at 0.2. Yeah. As, I mean, perhaps one should say these, of course, all calculations one would love to do, but um, these calculations, I mean, they're not exactly uh, cheap. And it's a bit like what Antoine said yesterday when he said, yeah, there might be in this phase diagram sort of like unexplored little corners where there might be um, D-wave superconductivity. We cannot exclude such things. Uh, on the other hand, in regard to what you said, Antoine, yesterday, I would then argue, well, um, in a way, if you look at these various coup rates, it seems a relatively robust phenomenon. And if then it happens that in the Hubbard model, it, it sort of like withdraws into well, a time. Well, T prime equals zero is irrelevant for coup rates. Yeah, we, we, we know. That. So, okay, yeah, then it's irrelevant anyways. But you see, if it well, then re survives in a tiny little corner, well, but Anton, yes, it's relevant because they have a T prime, but still the claim is the Hubbard model would be able to capture it, and then it should be a bit more robust. More as a philosophical question. It's of course irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Maybe I, just to make sure I understand what you're trying to say. You're trying to say that the MRG has a certain limit at the end of the sex mm -hmm. round. And now, with that, you uh, sort of benchmark the quantum Monte Carlo to we take allow it further, you to go further mm -hmm. and you obtain a phase diagram with that method looks yeah. like the real sperm. That's yeah. what you're trying to say. Yes. That's yes. yes. I'm always asking for more. I mean you have a plan to put a nearest neighbor repulsion because that's that's also, you know, gonna tip the balance between superconductivity and stripes and mm -hmm. it's also relevant to real yeah. 
Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> it depends on computing power and manpower. You know, like these students, they do, they do, they finish their PhD, and then what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a mixture. I mean, there are reasons why this now took two and a half years. In Aspen, you know, the last time when many of us met in person two and a half years ago. I had the first curves on T prime, and actually there was a slide which, of course, I eliminated, which showed AFQMC and DMRG in total disagreement. Um, I have forgotten what exactly had happened there, but we all had to, basically. I would say, as I said, 80% of the time was spent on actually to get it, to get the benchmarking reliable, and then now you can sleep well and produce curves, and we will see what we do at the next. Ask Shivay. Yeah, I mean he has to find the person. Yeah. Next door. Sorry. <laughs> And with these results you were presenting, Barry, there is this pairing uh, order parameter coming out. Is there some interpretation of this value of 0 0.02? Does this tell you something about like an energy scale under which the whole thing would break that one can compare to like? Do you mean that I would say I would like to compare this to a temperature or so? Would I want to commit to that? <laughs> no, not, not really. Would any one of the others, I mean, believing the value derived too much from that? I mean, the value, this relatively small value, is not untypical of what other people have seen in, in various approximations. Let's put it like this. Yeah. There would be now be very careful. You see, I try to limit myself to say things which, I, which let me sleep uh, <laughs> relatively well. <laughs> now we can compare to the values that were obtained by cluster extensions of the of T in that range yeah. of T prime. I don't think they are. As I said, I mean the values. That's what I said. The values. If you look at what other methods found, I think we are starting to agree everywhere. I mean this is, I think, one of the big message messages that also Antoine sent yesterday. Um, the numerical community is converging rapidly at the moment. I think we can say that. Not one nods, so okay, good. Yeah. Um, regarding the benchmarking of, uh, of uh, DMRG and the QMC, like, is it per parameter that you need to calibrate, or is it like system size that you need to calibrate? Like now, now when you have the width 6 matching with the, the FQMC, uh, exactly the same system. system. But if you now change your T prime, would you have to recalibrate? Uh, um, um, no, not in the sense that I think. Um, we, of course, also looked at other T prime values, but unsystematically. Um, um, sort of like we did not, we, there's no fitting parameter in the sense that sort of like we compare it and that tells then, say, QMC, there's some knob which you have to turn to make the agreement well. No, these are fit free, bias free agreements. So if it agrees very well for 0.2, it will agree very well also for 0.25 or 0.3, or at least I hope so, because we, we try to understand methods there. And the point is in, in the case of T prime equals zero, the presence of the nesting made these methods much more uh, robust. So it might be, of course, that if, if you go to totally different values of T prime, the physics might say, change so dramatically that it turns out that, say, I mean, DMF, DMRG will still work within its strong limitations, but that, for example, Shiba and company cannot come up with a good trial wave function, would have to invent a new one. But then we would be able to guide them and say, your trial wave function is not yet good enough. Think about a better one. Yeah. But that was actually not the case here. I mean, we did. I, I don't think we had any point where we said you used the wrong trial wave function. Uh, but there were other issues with the methods, which we simply have to understand. The main improvements there they had already made themselves in the years before. Okay, one last question. Uh, it wasn't a question, more a comment that the errors in um, this uh, projected wave function based QMC. And DMRG are very different, right? As you've yes. been saying, DMRG part. it's just finite size and bond dimension mm -hmm. and so on. But AFQMC relies on some nodal structure of many-body wave function, yeah. and that's a very dangerous thing yes. to kind of assume you get right because the whole point of a strongly interacting system is that it. You don't know the nodal structure. Yeah, but I mean that's exactly but, the point why we do this but, benchmarking but over then years. The benchmarking. Yeah. Cannot be if you do it at one value set of parameters, 
and there are phase transitions. You cannot rely yeah. on that. But that's ex it's perhaps I, sh I could not make this clear in the enough in that limited amount of time. This benchmarking was not done across one set of parameters and one system size, but it was done about a wide range from two leg ladders, four leg ladders, six leg ladders, and then of course we are done in DMRG for various values of T prime, for various boundary conditions. So, and that's why I was so insisting on these first slides after this teaser phase diagram, because this was the one was electron dope, the other one was whole dope, one was width four, the other one was width six, periodic boundary conditions, anti-periodic boundary conditions, whatever you do, we get the agreement. And that's when we started believing that we can trust the results of AFQMC. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon.